Hi, this is Dan Heisman, Philly Tutor for Chess FM, and this is the Improve Your Chess video series for ICC and WCL members. In today's video, we're going to look at a very interesting aspect of learning how to play chess well, which is developing your different types of chess vision. In teaching people, I've come to the conclusion that there are three different types of vision, and we'll talk about those three different types in a minute. One comment that I've said over the years that applies to all your visions is mentioned in Andy Soltis' book, The Wisest Things Ever Said About Chess. On page 269, his comment is, you can't play what you don't see. And he got this comment from me, quoting my Everyone's Second Chess book. What do I mean when I say you can't play what you don't see? Well, if you don't take the time to look around the board and look at different possibilities, you can't consider them to possibly play them. So if you only see a certain part of the board, or you only see certain moves, then if the other moves are better, you can't possibly play them if you don't see them. The three types of visions that I've come up with, I call board vision, tactical vision, and visualization. These are not new to me, of course. Visualization is the most well-known of these, so let's define that first. Visualization is what you have to do when you're analyzing a position and you have to look ahead and you have to imagine where the pieces are moving. You have to move the pieces in your head and you have to keep track of where all the pieces are at any point in your analysis. The better you can keep track of where all the pieces are, the better you can analyze because if you can't see them, as we just said, you can't play them. So if you lose track of where the pieces are or you have them on the wrong squares, that's visualization. Tactical vision is pretty easily defined. It's the ability to look at a position and pick out the basic tactical issues in the position. For instance, the seeds of tactical destruction, which are the things in the position that might allow one side or the other to get a tactic, which may be some sort of geometry or a weak back rank or an exposed king or loose pieces. Uh, these things fall under tactical vision. When you look at a board and you can fairly quickly determine what the safety issues are, that's tactical vision. Now, of course, your ability to analyze really difficult tactics where you have to look really deeply into the position is a little bit more than just tactical vision. Tactical vision usually refers to the safety issues that you can see at a fairly low depth, but of course you can improve your tactical vision to, to any depth. The third type of vision, which I think may be the most important, I call board vision. This is the ability to just look at a chessboard as it is without the pieces having moved at all and see what's going on on a chessboard. What's going on, meaning what's the material, uh, what pieces are attacking what square, which pieces are loose, uh, just which pieces are good and bad, and just looking at the position and trying to determine what's going on without actually having to analyze the position. So what I'd like to do first is I'd like to pick out kind of a random game in position and just go over with you what my board vision sees. So right now they're playing the Tata Steel Tournament. And let's just pick a game at random. I think there's 28 games in the library right now, 0 through 27. So let's pick a number, I don't know, 17, 19, 23, uh, 23. All right, we'll pick game 23, Caruana Carlson. All right, if I remember right, I think that game ended in draw, but I didn't see most of it. And let's just pick out a, a move somewhere in the middle of the game. Uh, let's pick out, uh, you know, let's go ahead 39 moves and pick out Black's 20th move. So if we go forward 39 we'll get to a position. All right, so let's use our board vision here and quickly figure out what's happening. Let's count the material. Both sides have two rooks and a minor piece. Uh, white has seven pawns. Black has seven pawns, so material is even. Uh, white's latest move was b4, which of course attacks the pawn on c5. He's trying to break up the pawn structure. White's pawns are a little dispersed. They're kind of up and down, uh, but nothing terrible. Uh, both kings are pretty safe. Black hasn't castled. Uh, white hasn't developed his queen bishop or his queen rook. Neither of black's rooks have moved. Uh, white can guard that pawn on e5 with a later f4, and white can get his kingside majority rolling here. White has a kingside majority of 4 on 3. Black has a kingside majority of 4 on 3. All right, that's about all we need to know to sort of tell you what the board vision is. We're not looking for any tactics or, or anything big. We're just trying to look at what's going on on the chessboard, look all around. If we had to name all the pieces that are not guarded, White's pieces that are not guarded is the rook on a1, the pawn on c2, the pawn on b4, the pawn on e5, the king, but we usually don't speak about unguarded kings. Black's unguarded pieces are the pawn on c5, the pawn on b7, the rook on a8, the rook on h8, and the pawn on g7. 
Okay, so board vision. Let's let's show a board vision puzzle. What I found from reading International Master Levitt's book, Genius in Chess, is that the better your board vision, the better the player, which is kind of amazing. You'd think, in general, that good players have better board vision, but that once you get above, above a certain level, everybody's board vision is about the same. But what he found was that even at the International Master and Grandmaster level, you could tell a 2300 player from a 2500 player by their board vision. Now, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Is it the board vision that makes you the better player or the better player that gives you the board vision? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. But if you work on your board vision, and there's lots of ways to do that, then that makes you a better player. So let's pick out a board vision puzzle. All right. When I give you this puzzle, and I haven't put it up yet, I want you to give me two numbers. What you can do is just stop the recording and come up with these two numbers. The first number is how many legal moves white will have in the position. And the second number will be how many of those moves are checkmate. All right, here we go. Here's the position. All right, if you have to, stop the video and count how many moves that white has, how many legal moves, and how many are checkmate. All right, here's how I would do this puzzle. The first thing I would look at the board and say, how many of white's pieces can move? Well, did you notice that the pawn on f4 can't move because it's pinned by the rook? The pawn on c6 can't move because it's pinned by the bishop. So the number of white pieces that can actually move are the knight on e3, the rook on d2, the bishop on b3, and the queen on a4. So left to right, the queen only has diagonal moves, two of them up, two of them down, so that's four. The bishop can only go to the right, five moves there, two moves there, so that's seven for the bishop. The rook can go left and right three, and up and down seven. And the knight in the middle of the board usually has eight moves unless it's blocked. And here, the knight's eight moves are all there. I'll take off all the lines. All the eight moves for the knight are there. Whoops, didn't mean to draw that line. Okay, let's see if we can do this with good coordination. And there's the eight knight moves. So now we just have to add those four numbers together. We got four for the queen, seven with the bishop, that's 11. Ten with the rook, that's 21 and 8 with a knight, that's 29. So white has 29 legal moves. How many of those moves are checkmate? Well, one of the things you'll notice is that the moves with the bishop, the rook, and the knight are all discovered checks. The bishop moves gives a discovered check with the queen. The rook moves gives a discovered check with the bishop. And the knight moves give discovered check with the rook. How about the queen moves? Well, the queen moves to b4 is check. The queen move takes the rook as check. The queen move to b2 is check. Queen to c1 is check. So all of the moves are check. The question is how many are checkmate? Well, you might notice that black doesn't have a lot of squares here for his king. And it turns out, if you look at every single possibility, for instance, knight to f5, the rook is checking the king. The king can't go up because of the knight and the queen. Can't go to c4 because of the bishop. Can't go here because of the knights, the rook, and the king. Can't go to c2. Can't take the rook. Can't go to b2. So that's checkmate. Same kind of thing if you move the bishop to any square, the queen checks, the king can't go places to the b-file because of the queen, he can't go up or down, he can't take the rook, the king's guarding these two squares, so that's checkmate. And if you try all the, the moves, you'll see every single one is checkmate. So the right answer to this board vision problem is 29-29. I bet if you give this problem to 30 of your friends and you time them, and you come up with a little algorithm that's based on how fast they answer and how accurately their two answers are, you can almost perfectly put them in order of how good their chess play is. So for instance, a 2000 player will probably be faster and more accurate than a 1900 player who will be faster and more accurate than an 18 and more than a 17 and more than a 16 and so on. Will that work perfectly? No, but you'd be amazed if you take 30 players and give this problem how much it'll be clear that the better players are a lot better. And what's interesting is we're not asking these players, you know, how do you play the Caro Can or how do you play the Lucena position in an endgame? This has nothing at all to do with their chess knowledge. You can give this puzzle to someone who just learned how to play chess yesterday. Your amount of chess knowledge that you have is not related at all to your board vision, except for the fact that people who play longer have better board vision and people who play longer tend to pick up more chess knowledge. But you don't have to be a good player to necessarily develop these skills. All right, so this is a board vision puzzle. Let's look at another completely different type of board vision puzzle. Let's look at this one. All right, this is a really interesting puzzle from Jeff Coakley's wonderful book, uh, Winning Chess Puzzles for Kids, Volume 2. In this puzzle, 
you have to switch any two pieces on the board. That's any two pieces. It could be a white and a black, a white and a white, a black and a black piece, and leave black in a legal checkmate. Well, if you look at the board right now, it looks like black is already in checkmate, but there's one problem. This is not a legal checkmate because both kings are in check. So again, you can stop the video because I don't want to sit here for 10 minutes with silence while you're doing the video. You can stop the video and see if you can switch any two pieces on the board and get a checkmate. But before you stop the video, keep in mind you can't put pawns on the first and eighth rank to create a legal position. So for instance, you can't switch the white king on f1 with a black pawn on a5 and say, well, that's checkmate now because white's king's out of check because you can't have a black pawn on f1. Sure, you could argue that it's going to promote, but Jeff Coakley has made that illegal for this kind of problem. So your goal is to switch any two pieces on the board, but you have to leave black in a legal checkmate, no pawns on the first or eighth rank. All right, good luck. All right, if you did the problem and you re started the video or if you decided you wouldn't try it. The only answer that works is to switch the queen on f3 with the pawn on e6. Queen on f3, pawn on e6. Every other switch has a problem. It's not a legal checkmate. But this is a legal checkmate. For instance, white might have just played a move like, let's say, queen on c3 capturing a pawn on c6 or something. Why is this checkmate? Because it's illegal for black's queen to capture white's queen because it's pinned to the king. So this is a board vision issue. And Jeff likes to put these kind of clever issues into his puzzles, which makes the book a lot of fun. Now, I've had a lot of students ask me, but Dan, if I do a puzzle like this, will it really make me a better player? Shouldn't I spend my time studying the Caro Can? Or maybe I should spend my time with white to play and win puzzles? And the answer is yes. It's much more effective in the long run to do mostly white to play and win, white to play and mate, you know, that kind of puzzles. But to do them exclusively as opposed to mostly is, is not correct in the sense that puzzles like this are not only fun, but they'll help you develop your board vision. And when you see what pieces can do, they're going to help you play better and they're going to help you solve the other kind of puzzles as well. So a steady diet of only this type of puzzle over, let's say, a five-year period is going to make your board vision a little better, but it's not going to teach you how to win games. So, yes, I wouldn't do these kind of puzzles exclusively unless you find them that much fun, and I do find them a lot of fun. But to say you would never, ever do one of these puzzles because it will never help you become a better chess player, well, that's just as wrong, too. There's a whole bunch of these type of board vision puzzles. In Chess Cafe, where I write my Novice Nook column, uh, Bruce Albertson has chess mazes, and in Willem's book, uh, the chess tactics workbook he has some too so I put one of Willem's in my library in this position you have to make nine consecutive white bishop moves black doesn't get a move at all and you have to capture the black king but you're not allowed to put your bishop on any square where a piece can capture you uh, the rules that Willem uses and the rules that Albertson uses are slightly different so when you're doing the puzzles, make sure to read the instructions carefully. All right, so let's see if we can do this puzzle. Well, there's not too many places the bishop can go without being captured. I think b4 is the first safe one that I see that way. And then to make some progress, we would have to go to a3, back to b2, and then kind of make a little zigzag similar here up to g7, to h6, to e3, to g1 to h2 and capture the king. So I think that would be the answer. So again, if you're having trouble finding bishop maneuvers, you can do this. If knights are your problems, and a lot of people have problems with knights, there's lots of chess mazes for knights. You can have a chess maze for just about any piece. I guess with a pawn, it's a little bit more difficult. But these help you visualize where the pieces can go. And of course, you wouldn't actually draw the lines on the board when you're doing it. You'd have to keep track of it. And that would not only help your board vision, but would also help your visualization. All right, let's go on to tactical vision. Let's look at an easy tactic. All right, this is white to play and win. All right, at first, everything looks relatively safe. Uh, black's pawn on f5 is guarded three times. His knight on e4 is guarded twice, attacked twice. Everything looks pretty good, but then you notice the seed of tactical destruction, which is this pin on the f file, which indicates that that pawn can't so easily take the knight on e4 which leads you to look at a first candidate move of rook takes e4. 
And now if black takes with the pawn, white just takes the rook with check, and he's ahead of bishop. But if black takes with the queen, white takes the queen, and black has the same problem. Pawn takes, rook takes, check. So after rook takes, black, of course, doesn't have to take the rook. He could just move the queen. But then white would just move the rook somewhere, and white's ahead of peace. So no matter how black plays it, white's going to end up ahead of peace. So that's a basic way of using your tactical vision. Okay, let's take a slightly different kind of problem. All right, in this position, we have a defensive problem. It's white's move, but if white does nothing, let's say white plays h3, black's going to take advantage of this pin and play e5. And that's going to win the bishop because the bishop has no square to retreat and guard the queen. And if the bishop moves to some square that doesn't retreat and guard the queen, then black's going to take off the queen. And if white just sits there, the pawn will take the bishop. So that's the threat. The threat is if white does nothing, e5. So white has to get ready for that. Well, that's not so easy. If we just move the queen to a random square, the queen, the black queen is going to play queen takes d4 check. Uh, if white puts the bishop in the way on d3 with the idea of, wow, if he takes the bishop, I can check him and win the queen, that doesn't work because queen takes d4 is check, which gives black a chance to save his queen. There is no discovery now. The queen can't get up to g4, which would normally be a square that could guard it. It can't get up to a4. He can't go to g1. He can't go to a1. If he counterattacks the knight first with b3, well, that temporarily saves him. But suppose black just saves the knight first. Let's say he puts it on a square where... I don't know, let's ask the computer what's the best square for the knight here. Mr. Computer, computer says knight takes a3, and he does save it. All right, so knight takes a3, queen a1, and that's a way of saving the queen. All right, what if the queen just went up to d3 in this position? Well, now black has a very cute move. He's got f5 hitting the bishop, and if the bishop tries to go back to a8, then queen c8, and the bishop is getting trapped. So this is actually a pretty tough defensive problem. So the, the obvious queen d3 fails to f5 and queen c8, and the only really good move that saves you here, according to my friend Houdini, is b3, and after knight a3, that gives you a chance to play queen a1. Black's doing okay here, but white didn't lose a piece. You can have offensive tactical problems. You can have defensive tactical problems. So your tactical vision there gets a good workout trying to save the piece. All right, now let's talk about our third type of chess vision, which is visualization. All right, in this puzzle, it's white to play. And we're going to ignore the main issue, which asks about the e5 pawn. And we're going to ask a different question. We're going to say, if white plays knight takes e5, and if black should happen to play queen e7, and white should start trying to just guard that knight, can black pile up on that knight and win it? Well, when I ask my students that question, sometimes they say to me, let's look at the following sequence. Knight takes e5, queen e7, and now let's say white tries to guard the knight with something like f4 or bishop f4, let's say f4. And then they say, well, black can pile up on that knight and play bishop to d6. So that's their analysis. Knight takes e5, queen e7, f4, bishop d6. What's wrong with that analysis? Well, the answer is that bishop to d6 is illegal. They have what's called a retained image error. That's what Grandmaster Krogius called it in his book Chess Psychology, which I bought about 40 years ago. I hate to say those things make me makes me feel really old. But uh, after knight takes e5, queen e7, f4, the bishop can't go to d6 because the queen on e7 is in its way. So knight takes, queen e7, f4, bishop d6. It's easier to miss this when the queen's not yet on e7 because your board vision tells you the queen's on d8. It's your visualization from your analysis that has to tell you it's now on e7. And if you forget that, it looks like the bishop can get to d6. So that's a very typical type of visualization error, losing track of things. In Andy Soltis' wonderful book, Studying Chess Made Easy, he gives a visualization sequence. So let's uh, look at this exercise. 
I put it in my library here. Okay, in this exercise, what Andy says you should do is you want to make consecutive moves for white. And after each move, you want to say what piece is being guarded and what it's being guarded by. What it's, so white pieces that are guarding and guarded, I guess is a better way to put it. And after each move, the piece is going to stay on that square. In other words, if I give you two moves, they're not both going to be from this position. The first move is going to be from this position, but the second move will be from the position after the piece moved. So in this case, let's do the first two moves. The first move is rook e3, and now you have to say who's guarding who and which piece is guarding what by that move. Well, after rook e3, the answer is the knight on d5 is guarding the rook on e3. The second move is knight f6. All right, but now remember, the rook's still on e3. You have to visualize the rook being on e3. So now the rook's on e3, the knight is on f6. And now the answer is that the bishop on d8 is guarding the knight on f6. The third move is bishop to b6. And now the answer is that the bishop on b6 is guarding the rook on e3. Got it? All right, well, I'm going to give you 10 moves. And again, if you need to, you can stop the video. But I'll, I'll wait about 10 seconds between each move. And these are going to be the 10 consecutive moves that you're going to do and figure out what piece is guarding which after each move. All right, the first move for white, as we already said, is rook e3. The second move is knight f6. I'll do the first three quickly since we already did those. The third move is bishop b6. The fourth move is rook a3. The fifth move is queen f4. The sixth move is knight to d7. The seventh move is bishop c7. The eighth move is queen f3. The ninth move is rook a5. The tenth move is bishop f4. All right, so now let's actually look at the sequence and see how you did. First move is rook e3. Knight guards the bishop. Second move is knight f6. Bishop guards the knight. Third move is bishop b6. Bishop guards the rook. Fourth move is rook a3. Queen guards the rook. Rook guards the queen. Fifth move is queen f4. Queen guards the knight. Sixth move is knight d7. Knight guards the bishop. Seventh move is bishop c7. Bishop guards the queen, and now the queen guards the bishop. Eighth move is queen f3. Rook guards the queen. Queen guards the rook. Ninth move is rook a5. Bishop guards the rook. And finally, the tenth move is bishop f4. Queen guards the bishop. You could even say things like what they know. You could do it again and say what they no longer guard. For instance, you could say on the tenth move, bishop f4, you can say the bishop is no longer guarding the rook, but now the queen is guarding the bishop. That would make it even harder. And you could do more than 10 moves. You could do 20 moves. You could do 100 moves. If four pieces on the board is too hard for you, try it with three pieces on the board. If four pieces on the board is too easy for you, try it with five pieces on the board. So this is a suggestion for improving your visualization from Andy Saldis. All right, finally, uh, let's take a look at how I combine my tactical vision and my visualization in a game I played against a few years ago against Richard Parisot. All right, now in this position, I played queen to g4. Now my tactical vision told me that I'm allowing a double attack with bishop to e2 but I also calculated a fairly deep combination that told me that he couldn't do that, a combination I'm very proud of. So again, if you need to stop the video, stop the video, see if you can find any reason why black can't play bishop to e2. All right, here's the answer. The answer is bishop e2, which is what Master Pariso played. I played 
queen takes c8 and now he can't play rook takes because rook takes check will win back the queen and more so he has to play bishop takes d1 now he's threatening to take my queen but i play queen e6 check threatening to take off his queen and his bishop therefore it's forced for him to trade queens but now i'm attacking his bishop and i'm attacking his rook his rook needs to attack my knight which he did by playing rook to e8 and now i simply took off the bishop in order to get his piece back he had to take there and now i played rook to b1 removing the guard on the square and he can't move his rook up to e4 and guard the knight so if he moves the rook i'll take off the knight and if he moves the knight i'll play bishop to d5 and pin the rook to the king and i'll win so let's go back and look at that that's about a five move combination so let's this time see if you can visualize it bishop e2 queen takes c8 bishop takes d1 queen e6 check queen takes e6 knight takes e6 rook e8 or rook f6 same difference rook takes d1 rook takes e6 and now remove the guard with rook to b1 and you're threatening both rook takes b4 or if the knight moves bishop d5 he can't stop both and white wins so what I'm using here is some of my very best tactical vision but I also in order to play that tactic I have to be able to see the board at each point because if I can't see the board then no matter how good my deductive logic is and no matter how good my tactical patterns are if I can't see all the pieces in the right square on each step then I can't deduce what I need to do so I need visualization I need tactical vision I need good deductive logic those are the three big skills and of those three skills deductive logic is the hardest one to work on that's the most innate ability but you can greatly improve your tactical vision and your visualization by practicing okay I hope you found today's video very thought-provoking and interesting and helpful I enjoyed doing it for the ICC and WCL and chess FM this is Dan Heisman. We'll see you next time. Bye.